My name is Tom, and I'm an underproofer. I admit it, I've underproofed a lot of loaves. This recipe tends to underproof for me. I'm four and a half hours into bulk fermentation, and I'm just barely at the 30% rise mark, which is what's called for. So I always tend to rush the uh, pre-shaping and final shaping with this recipe. But today, I think I actually have sufficiently proofed this. My temperature got away from me a little bit, so it sped up a little in the middle. I'm seeing really domed activity on the top here, some bubbles on the top, plenty of bubbles around the edges. And when I shake the bowl, this dough is getting pretty loose. I mean, looser than it typically looks. So I got to move on four and a half hours into bulk fermentation. I hope it's done. So loaf number one, our tartine loaf, I'm going to try to pre-shape this exactly by the book. So we dump this out of our vessel. That looks really good. I'm seeing a lot of gluten strands here. This actually looks pretty far along, so let's move on. So following the tartine recipe, you put this onto an unfloured work surface then you lightly flour the top. Now, if you look at some of my prior videos, when I read the, the phrase lightly flour, I would use this shaker and just douse this thing like I was putting powdered sugar on a Cinnabon. Uh, what I've learned is that when you flour the entire top of the loaf for pre-shaping, what you're seeing on the top turns inside to the loaf and you get weak seams. You get that raw flour inside the loaf and it really tends to open up and give you irregular gas bubble in the crumb. So when it says lightly flour, I literally just flour the crown here because that's the only part of this loaf that's really going to remain the top. Everything else kind of remains the middle. Now this makes it difficult because it's incredibly sticky to work with. So what some people do to make it less sticky is they use flour. Other people use water. I've been trying a little bit of both here, and, and I'm going to go with using water on this one. I have this new bench scraper, which has a little different angle to it. I'm still getting used to it, and it's incredibly slippery. But we're going to see what happens here. So I'm basically going to flip this over to pre-shape it. This is my top now. It doesn't look very pretty. I'm going to flip this. I really mauled that. That's kind of a mess. The way the tartine pre-shaping works is Chad Robertson recommends that you grab the corners of the dough and you stack it on top of itself. So all through bulk fermentation, if you think back now, when you get to pre-shaping, you have to think about what happened before this step and what happens after this step. Before this step, we didn't do anything in terms of really building height. We just kept doing the stretch and folds. In the other loaves, we were doing the coil folding. We were really building height throughout. So what Chad does is he really comes on strong here at the end to build the height of the loaf. What he recommends is you just grab the corners of this and fold the corners on top. So we go like this, one, two, three, four, five, six. Look at the height that I just created. I mean, that, that ball of dough is sitting up three and a half or four inches off of the countertop. So that's halfway through the pre-shaping is we built the height. Now we need to flip it over and round it. So I like to start in this corner. I'm just going to do a couple of turns with the, the dough scraper and see if I can get this to round up in about three turns. I don't like to overdo this at all. Maybe four. There it is. That's all I want to do with that. I'm already stretching the top of that loaf. You can really stretch the top of the loaf really thinly and create a weak spot there. I'm going to let that sit now for 30 minutes. For loaf number two pre-shaping, we have an interesting opportunity here because I did that coil fold so late in the process. Let me lift this dough out. I'm going to lift this one differently because this is already largely shaped based on that last coil fold that we did. This actually has quite a bit of height and structure to it. So I'm actually just going to use the bench knife and turn this into a round. There it is. I just built a little bit of surface tension and rounded that out. That dough is sitting up fairly high. 
So I'm gonna go with that for loaf number two. And then loaf number three, similarly, all along the way, we did a lot of structural shaping to this. So I'm just gonna to try to tighten this up and keep some of that shaping that we've already done. So again, you think of the timeline, the bulk fermentation, pre-shaping, final shaping, you basically have to build the height somewhere. We built a lot of height during bulk fermentation when we made these loaves. So I'm trying to leverage that work that we already did and not overdo it. What I found in some of my experimental videos, I did a three-part series on the impact of final shaping, pre-shaping, and bulk fermentation. I found out that pre-shaping actually deteriorated the quality of my crumb in a lot of cases because your crumb is really set up coming out of bulk fermentation. And sometimes just doing that perfunctory step of pre-shaping because somebody says you have to do it can actually really mess up the crumb. So I'm trying to back off of what I'm doing in pre-shaping now, unless I have really loose dough coming out of bulk fermentation, or obviously if you're doing a large mass of dough, a large bulk of dough, and you have to divide the loaves, you have to pre-shape them to get them into a round. But with these single loaves, pre-shaping is overrated. There it is. Three turns done, that's pre-shaped. So I'm pre-shaping, all I'm looking for is I wanna get that height, I want the loaf to pop up a little bit, and I wanna tighten the skin a little bit to create surface tension. But the more times you turn it and spin that dough, it creates a real weak spot in the top. I can actually see on this one, the top, as soon as I stopped, sunk down a little bit because I created a little weak spot on that loaf. So that's all we wanna do on pre-shaping. I've really kind of backed off my pre-shaping handling based on what I said, one of the things that I've learned, don't let pre-shaping mess up a perfectly good crumb coming out of bulk fermentation. Okay, these sit for 30 minutes, then we'll do final shaping. So as we wait for the bench rest to complete, let me just recap what we did on the three loaves from top to bottom. Sometimes it's hard to follow along when I go through round by round. So on loaf one, this was the one where we followed it by the book. We basically did very minimal mixing up front, one minute to get the fermentalis mix into a shaggy ball, one minute to mix in the salt, incredibly minimal hand mixing at first on loaf number one. Then we did six stretch and folds using the standard stretch and fold method. Those became increasingly light as we got uh, to the fifth and sixth stretch and fold. No real structural building of the dough in bulk fermentation like we did in some of the other loaves. Loaf number two was where we bent the rules. We did a little bit heavier hand mixing up front and you could see on that first stretch and fold how much gluten development we got by doing that. Then when we got into the bulk fermentation handling, we did three standard stretch and folds and did three upside down coil folds very late into bulk fermentation, four hours into bulk fermentation, we were still handling that dough. So there was a lot of handling in loaf number two and a lot of late handling in loaf number two. So we'll look at what impact that has on the crumb. And then loaf number three, was where we did the three and a half hour auto lease, which we didn't do on any of the other loaves. We did extensive hand mixing to mix the ferment lease. And then I did the slap and fold, very aggressive mixing of that dough early on. So incredibly heavy front end hand mixing of the dough. Then when we got into bulk fermentation, we did two stretch and folds and then really lightened up on this one and just did those three gentle coil folds throughout the rest of the process. So that's the comparison of the three loaves. So when I try to figure out how to do final shaping on these loaves, you have to look back at the structure chain. The combination of what happened in bulk fermentation, what happened in pre-shaping, will determine largely what you have to do in final shaping. So when you think about those three elements, bulk, pre, and final, you have to have strong shaping in two of those three. So for example, in loaf number one, we had fairly weak development of structure in bulk fermentation. So you can see what Chad Robertson does. He does a super strong pre-shaping and a fairly tight final shaping. 
He does the structural build and final shaping. So weak, strong, strong. In loaf number two, I did a huge amount of handling very late in, in the process. So I'm coming out of bulk fermentation with very strong dough. I essentially took a pass on pre-shaping. So I probably have to do a tighter final shaping. You have to have two of those three be either strong or tight. And then on loaf number three, we did a lot of structure building in the bulk fermentation. We did a weak pre-shaping, so I have to come back with a tight final shaping. So I think on these loaves, we'll do the tartine method on loaf number one, because that's what's dictated by the book. And I'd say that's a moderate to tight final shaping. And then we're gonna do a tight final shaping on loaf two and a tight final shaping on loaf three. The only risk we have is on loaf two, we did so much handling so late in the process that that loaf is gonna to wanna to open up and we're gonna tighten that down on final shaping so we could end up with a dense crumb on loaf number two. So I may moderate that final shaping a little bit. We'll see how the dough feels when I take a look at it. Okay, the bench rest of 30 minutes is complete. We're ready for final shaping. So these pre-shaped rounds look pretty good. They kept their height really well. They didn't flatten out. So that means that they have good structure or it means that they're still slightly underproofed. I'm gonna see when I feel these, what they feel like. So let's start with loaf number one. I'm gonna follow the tartine method as closely as possible, although the book really shows how to do a bool fold and I wanna do three batards here. So I'm going to do a slightly modified version based on Chad Robertson's Betard folding as well. So this dough looks pretty good. It does not feel really slack. So these, these may just be on the edge of being fully proofed. So I like to stretch this out into a rectangle and then following the tartine, classic tartine fold. The way we do this is you basically fold the bottom up a little past halfway, you stretch the sides out, fold the left side over, fold the right side over. Now this is the issue that I've had with tartine, is the last step when you're making a bool is you wanna fold this flap down to close the package, but look at that hole right there. I mean, if you were trying to create an air gap in a loaf, that's how you would do it. I mean, there's a big opportunity there for an air gap in the loaf. So what Chad Robertson does with his Batard fold is he folds that front flap over right into that gap, then he does a little shoelace stitch and then rolls it forward. Because this is a small loaf, I don't have enough mass here to do the shoelace stitch and the roll, so I'm just gonna do a little bit of a modified version of it. I'm just gonna do a fold and a roll. So I grab this flap I fold it short and I tuck it in that hole to make sure that we don't get air in there. Then I roll this towards me. Super sticky. I try not to use any flour until I actually get the basic loaf folded because you don't want any of that flour on the inside. Then you have the option to tighten down the ends. Some people just pinch them down, some people fold them under with the bench scraper. I try not to do too much handling. And then this loaf looks a little fat. So I really just lightly build that surface tension to keep this from flattening out when it goes into the oven. That looks pretty good. Now, I'm gonna let that sit for a few minutes to make sure that that seam on the bottom seals. And then once I'm finished with that handling, I do like to dust a little bit more flour on the top just to get some crust on there. It'll help it also to keep from sticking in the banneton. I have rice flour, 
in the Banatons, but I find that this also helps. That's a good looking loaf. Okay, that sat for a few minutes. I'm gonna flip that into the Banneton. I don't actually use Banetons. I just use these loaf pans with linen towels in them. And then that's a mix of rice flour and bread flour. That loaf looks pretty good. I like to shake it to see what kind of movement I have in the loaf there. It's definitely not overproofed. So that's number one, I'm gonna set that aside. Moving on to loaf number two. So for loaf number two, final shaping, this is where we did that handling very late in the process. Um, I basically skipped pre-shaping. So I'm gonna do, I'd say a moderately tight final roll up on this. Not quite as tight as I just did the tartine loaf, uh, something in between. The reason I'm not doing this super tight is because I did that coil fold late in the process, I did that handling late in the process, and I wanna give this the opportunity to open back up. And if I really tighten it down, I think it's gonna create a dense crumb because of the late handling. It's just my theory. Yeah, th this dough does not feel overproof to me at all. It looked much looser coming out of the bowls. Um, it actually looks fine right now. So for this loaf, I'm just gonna do a very simple batard roll up. I just stretch it out into a rectangle. I fold one third over. I like to pat that down a little bit to really get that seam sealed. And then the second one, I fold it over just to the middle there. You don't want to fold it all the way over because then you get a real fat loaf in the middle. And again, I tap that seam down a little bit. And now as I roll this towards me, I want this to be a little bit of an arrowhead shape so that the inside of my loaf is smaller than the outside of my loaf. You'll see why when I get down to the bottom here. So I put my three fingers on the bottom and roll this forward and then use my index fingers to press it down. And you can see by doing that little arrowhead shape, it keeps these ends from really flopping out. Now I can just easily pinch those down. So by doing that little arrowhead shape, it just keeps the top of the loaf compact so as you're rolling it up it tucks it on the inside and then that last roll gives you the flaps to close down the ends. Again I have the option to tighten this with the bench scraper. You really just have to size up the dough and see how much tightness and tension you have. That looks pretty good. Loaf number two into the banneton. And now for loaf number three, this was our coil folded loaf with all the heavy handling up front. I'm gonna do a super tight roll up on this because we handled this thing so gently through the whole process. Ever since the slap and fold, we've been really gingerly touching this loaf. This can use kind of a tight roll at the very end in my opinion. And there's that weak spot. I could see that when I was doing the pre-shaping, I saw that little dimple down. When you do that pre-shaping too many times, it creates like a mushroom cap effect under the, the dough, where it stretches the top of the dough back down here around the sides and it really thins out that middle. You really wanna be careful when you're pre-shaping and as I said, never let pre-shaping ruin a perfectly good loaf. I really created a problem for myself there with that weak spot. There's not a lot you can do about that. It's gonna fold up roughly in the middle of my batard roll. I don't have any other way to shape this. It's right in the middle, no matter what type of shaping I would do. So that's just a lesson learned with pre-shaping. So we'll do the standard batard, tri-fold this side over. And this, this loaf's coming out really long. Fold that over, and then I'm gonna degas this. 
a little bit more than I normally do. Just want to try some different techniques on these three loaves. And then I just go for my little arrowhead effect here. Fold and tuck, fold and tuck. I'm doing this fairly tightly three times, four times, five times. Tighten that with the bench scraper, fold my ends over. That loaf looks pretty good. So now, loaf three into the banneton. So now we have a decision to make about these loaves. With the tartine recipe, you have the option to either do a three to four hour countertop proof or an overnight cold retard. In my experience, I tend to have better looking loaves when I do the three to four hour countertop proof than when I do the cold retard. I think it's just because they proof better at room temperature than they do with the finished proof in the refrigerator. But I prefer the flavor of the overnight cold retard in the refrigerator. The, the same day loaves with three to four hour countertop proof just don't have that sour, complex sour flavor. So you have to go with the overnight cold retard in my opinion, but what I'm gonna do here is a little bit of a hybrid approach where I'm gonna let these sit on the countertop and continue to proof before I put them into the refrigerator. Now, when you put a loaf into the refrigerator, you have to understand what's going on. Now, I made this chart based on a bake I did a couple weeks ago. You can see this on the screen. And basically what this shows is I put a probe thermometer into one of my loaves when I put it into the refrigerator and I took readings every 30 minutes for 10 hours. So what happens, and this is fascinating, is you put a loaf in the refrigerator, my refrigerator temperature is 39 degrees Fahrenheit, it's like four degrees Celsius, and you assume that your loaf immediately gets to that temperature and it stops proofing. It really doesn't. As you can see by the chart, it keeps its temperature for quite a while. So if I put these loaves into the refrigerator at 78 degrees Fahrenheit, 25.5 degrees Celsius, even after two hours, it's only down to 54 degrees Fahrenheit, 12.2 degrees Celsius. So for two hours, there's still some active fermentation going on in the refrigerator. And then it takes almost eight hours before it actually gets down to refrigerator temperature. So when you put a loaf in the refrigerator, it's continuing to proof, it's continuing to ferment much more than I think people realize, but not as much as I need it to. So, I'm going to leave these loaves out on the countertop. I think what I'm going to do is try to mix things up here is I'll do loaf number one. I'm going to let it rest for 30 minutes before going in the refrigerator. Loaf number two, I'm going to let it rest for an hour before going in the refrigerator. And loaf number three, I'm going to rest for 90 minutes before going in the refrigerator, really to see what impact that final finished proofing will have on these loaves. If loaf three looks like it's, it's running away from me and overproofing on that countertop temperature, I won't let it go an hour and a half. But I think I want to experiment with pushing that proofing a little bit before these go in the fridge and then we'll bake them up in the morning.